Environmental DNA, for those of you who don't know, anything living in an aquatic environment is shedding DNA in its environment. So anything living in here is, is shedding DNA. Um, this is a process for which we are able to determine what's in here based on the DNA in this water sample. So it's a very powerful and, and useful tool. Um, it's something that um, we started using out on the coast and kind of our process for collecting these samples has been kind of evolving. Thanks to the incredible community of, of biologists we have out there, this has really started from pretty, Nicole has been there literally since the very beginning and it's it, humble beginnings, yeah, to where we are today. I just went out and collected a water sample from this river um, just to get a little bit into that before I, I dive into how this works. Um, when you're collecting a water sample, you want to make sure that you're doing everything you can to not contaminate the sample by collecting it like upstream of where you're standing or kicking up a bunch of muck. So this is what I call my front country eDNA kit. And I'll briefly talk about my back country eDNA kit. But this is a self-contained system that we came up with through lots of trial and error. And essentially what we're going to be doing is taking this water sample and running it, for the for the uh, for the for brevity's sake, uh, we won't do a full sample here. But we're going to be running 250 to milliliters to a liter of water through this filter that's inside this filter funnel. And what's going to happen is that filter inside here, a very fine filter, um, is going to be capturing any any DNA fragments in this water sample. We'll then send this sample, uh, this filter, into a lab. And they will run uh, this filter through a next generation sequencing machine, which will conduct what's called a metabar coding DNA analysis. And it'll tell us everything that's on this filter. It'll run it through a catalog called the iMuFish catalog. And anything within that catalog, any DNA that's in there, um, will be sent back to me with certain levels of confidence interval um, based on concentrations of DNA in the sample. How it starts, typically this is a two-person job, and I also should say that contamination is something that, um, that we think about a lot when we're doing this, right? Because we all have DNA, and not only do we have DNA, we're exposed to DNA from other things. Some of the first samples we collected, um, the lab came back and they were like, yeah, you don't have wolves on the peninsula, do you? And I was like, no, because our lab's in Colorado. And I was like, we don't, no, we have coyotes. And he's like, no, yeah, do you have a dog? I was like, I do. He's like, yeah, we found some dog DNA. Uh, and also, I'm a little question, I'm questioning some of that uh, bobcat DNA that we've, any cat owners have been in the field with me. So we wear gloves. Um, and um, we, we, we try our best um, with the technology and kind of how it's evolved now, actually, contamination is as big of an issue as when this started. When this all started, we were hand pumping, which can be pretty time consuming. So we developed this little setup here um, that, that does the pumping for you. So I'm gonna turn this on and external battery source. This is just a simple vacuum pump connected to some master flex tubing. You know, here we have our, 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 um, our cylinder and um, this little, a lot of this stuff is retrofitted in my little shop at home. Um, a lot of, a lot of things that you just have to, you buy a lot of weird stuff on the internet and uh, retrofit it to your, I'm sure a lot of you have, have done a little bit of that in your careers. So what we do is we pour the water in the filter funnel. We then turn on the our vacuum pump. And as you see, it's, it's, it's a bit of a slow process here, but the, um, the vacuum pump is pulling air through this tube and the water is going into this, into this um, beaker here. It's a fairly slow process because as I mentioned before, the filter um, is, is very, um, it's, it, it's got very small pores in it. So it's, it's, it's collecting any, any DNA fragments in this sample. So generally speaking, we try to pull about 500 milliliters to a liter of water, you know, to ensure that we're, we're getting any DNA within this, it's in this water sample. And as these samples move through the filter, as, as the coastal bios can attest to, uh, it starts to slow down a little bit as things like sediment, you know, um, any, anything that's in that water is starting to get caught in there. Sometimes we find, you know, um, detritus, just different, different types of things get caught in the filter and slow it down, but that's all okay. Um, that doesn't uh, adversely affect the, the quality of the DNA sample. So once, once this gets to the end, 
Um, that's, that's all I'll do for the, for the sake of brevity here. But, um, and once you get kind of close, as we're getting here, you start watching. Once the water goes all the way through, I like to let the pump dry out the filter a little bit more. Um, once I pull the, the filter out of the filter funnel, I'll be putting it in this whirl pack bag with silica. Um, you know, because we're a little bit concerned about deterioration of the DNA fragments and moisture can deteriorate DNA over time. So here we go, it's gone through. Okay, let that dry out for a minute. Okay, now we're going to, and this is the part where contamination and being really careful is, um, is kind of of the utmost importance through this whole process, but we're going to now extract the filter and put it in the Whirlpack bag with the silica. This is the filter. I will show everyone kind of what it looks like. We fold it like this. We then put it in the silica. And if we were collecting an actual sample here and sending it to the lab, we'd be labeling this. Generally, kind of the division of labor is one person's running the machine. Someone else would be um, doing data, collecting GPS. Um, we'd, we'd like to also collect some kind of simple habitat information as well as, you know, lat long information like that. We also do replicate sampling. So typically we'd be collecting a second sample as well um, if we were doing this um, in one of our surveys. And that's just to ensure that, um, you know, we're, if, if we're declaring that an environment is, is uh, has a species present, um, we want to ensure that we have two samples to, to, to verify that. So this is what we do in the backcountry. This is a $6 oil transfer pump that I bought at Harbor Freight. So there's no filter in here right now, um, but I just want to show you how we would do this if we were in a backcountry environment. So. <laughs> It's a little simpler, it's a little sleeker. Um, if, you're, if you're trying to run water through a filter in a place like further down in the system like this where you're just gonna have a lot of sediment, it would take probably an hour to pull a full, a full sample. Um, but like when, you know, Nicole and I have been up in some really extreme headwater areas, you know, where you have pretty clear water, um, it's a really efficient tool for, for systems like that. Um, and it's really lightweight, it fits really easily in a backpack. And the process for pulling the sample out and everything like that is, is the same. So we just kind of have two, two tools in our toolkit for, for pulling water through these filters essentially. And um, once you get back to your office, um, I generally put these in the freezer. And then when I have about 20 to 40 samples, I send them into the lab, um, at which point they process them and then they send me back um, a couple Excel spreadsheets um, that um, there's quite a bit of QAQC involved in this because as I mentioned before, there's kind of the issue of concentration, like how much DNA is, is, in, is in each sample. Um, and you know, generally speaking, there are some literature that I can tell you best practices for sort of um, interpreting that data so you can be extremely confident that if you're saying, for instance, Chinook are in this reach here, um, that, that that's a, um, there's, there's very little um, doubt that, that that species is in that environment. We've had a lot of success on the coast with, with using this with the Metabar um, sampling or processing that we're doing now. Um, it's really interesting because, you know, obviously as, as salmon focused fish biologists and habitat biologists, we're interested in the distributions of salmon in these systems, but now we're getting information about things like caudus, we're, 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 we know where sculpin are, lamprey, um, you know, on the coast we have an endemic species called the Olympic mud minnow where we have very little information about the distributions or life histories of those fish, so we're collecting this information that's kind of extremely useful as habitat scientists because these are species that are indicator species and a lot of them and their life histories can tell us a lot about these environments and the quality or quantity of those habitats. So this type of information just fits in really, really well with habitat data because it's, I always say eDNA is, is, is more or less a qualitative tool because you're looking at these habitat systems and now you're looking at the community composition and distribution of fish kind of in relation to habitat, which just gives you 
you a, a lot of information when you really want to like thoroughly delineate these systems and understand them the best you can, because then you're you're able to make much more informed you know monitoring decisions, but also restoration decisions. Like a lot of us spend a lot of time wondering where to spend these big grants and, and where can we get the biggest bang for our buck in restoration. And I think as we're having these shifting baselines and and fish populations are are changing, like fish behavior is changing as a result. We're seeing that at least on the coast, we're seeing that in a pretty large way. Um, this is just another tool in our toolbox to, to kind of continue that. And sometimes if we find a novel, a novel species somewhere, um, this is actually just the first step. And then at that point, we'll, we'll engage with, with something like snorkel surveys or more traditional fish capture surveys, because that will get to the question of, um, you know, of abundance. Because there are, there are kind of ways in developing research to get to the question of abundance with eDNA. But at this point, um, you know, it's, it's as, as we say sometimes, like it doesn't quite hold up in court yet for like how many fish are up there. We just know that they're there. Oh, nice, Nicole. Nice. The eagle question. Oh, thank you very much. That was great. So I get that. I get this question. Nicole was asking me that kind of as a joke, but every time I've ever given an eDNA talk, people always say, well, how do you know John Hagen, coastal habitat biologist, like how do you know that a salmon didn't just drop a juvenile Chinook in that reach where you tested positive for Chinook? And like, so the, the answer to that is we're, look, we're talking about concentrations high enough to be detected in a water sample. So if we're getting a positive ID on a species here, there's more than just a single uh, juvenile um, species of that in here. There's, there's several. And again, like how much, things like that kind of depends a lot on the environment. Like this is a large, a large, you know, high order system for, further down in the system here. If I was doing a real EDNA sample here, I'd collect about probably three samples across this, this, um, this channel here. I do one here, one in the middle, one on the other bank, because you wouldn't necessarily be determining what's over there across this river right here, just because you have you know, a lot of water in between those two. Um, but the concentrations indicate abundance more than a single, a single species, a single fish. Thank you for that. So if 12 eagles dropped 12 juvenile Chinook in the upper Bogashiel, um, we would have a, a false positive, but we'd have a much more interesting story, I think. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. Are there any questions? Bruce. Beyond fish, what do you think? What can you pick up? So actually, anything that sheds DNA, and, and the lab we're using right now, Jonah Ventures, a little plug for them. I don't get any kickbacks from them. Um, but I've been singing their praises. So the way they do next generation sequencing, the metabarcoding, um, you can kind of pay for different taxa sets. So we do fish, but there's macroinvertebrates. Um, you can actually even do vegetation. I mean, we wouldn't need, you know, there's like invasive species, people are using it for not weed and stuff like that. Um, but um, for some reason, I, I don't actually know the answer to this, to this but um, we're picking up other species sometimes in our, our uh, so we've gotten American beaver, um, we've gotten um, wood duck, we've gotten coastal tailed frog in some of our samples. Um, as I mentioned before, we got uh, Canis Americana, uh, <laughs> which is probably my black lab. Um, we've gotten Homo sapien lots of times. I have three of these kits um, that, that, that we made and I, um, you know, kind of have been checking them out to the tribes and eventually I'm going to have a couple for each tribe. Um, it's really handy. They're, everything's in there. It's kind of this fully self-contained. There's a backpack. They're heavy and uncomfortable. You wouldn't want to hike 20 miles with this, but if you're hiking 20 miles, you know, you have, you have this set up. Um, so if anybody's thinking about eDNA and thinking about buying a $3,000 Smith root backpack, come talk to me first. This is about 500 bucks. Um, <laughs> And it works. I've done side-by-side -side comparison with the uh, Smith Root equipment, and it works just as well.